Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to another session on uh, Spire Sessions, uh, the food series. So we're continuing our conversations with market experts uh, in the food sector across the region. Today, we have a very special guest. Uh, we've got Stefan from My Grocer. My Grocer is a rapidly growing, very exciting company that is providing online grocery deliveries. Uh, welcome, Stefan. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Javed. Thank you for, for having us. Um, if we can just start off, let's get the ball rolling. If you could maybe just tell us a little bit more about my grocer. Um, I live in Singapore, so I haven't had the chance to, to shop. Uh, I know you're operating in the Malaysia market. It looks like a very, very extensive uh, range of products that you're offering. But please, if, if you could tell us about you know, how the concept came about and what you're doing. Cool. So uh, to tell you that story, I need to go backwards a bit. So uh, many years ago, uh, back when I was young and idealistic, I actually wanted to be a computer programmer, a software programmer, and I trained for it. And then I escaped and, and uh, I, I became a journalist. I became a consultant. I got the chance to do a lot of very interesting work, with interesting brands around the world. And that work took me around the world. And, you know, when you travel around the world, you sort of pick up habits, and one of the things that I picked up, and I love to eat, I cook, I eat, uh, I like to entertain with food, uh, was the ability to pick up fantastic ingredients, uh, experience local flavors, and sort of bring those things together. So, you know, it's, it's a language of food in many ways. And, and that's also very, very true to Malaysia and Southeast Asia in general. I mean, the, the legendary battles for who owns what dish in this part of the world kind of points towards that. And so... Uh, looking at that, when, when we finally were, were coming to the end of my last position, which was in consulting, uh, I was looking for something new to do. And we realized that in every other part of the world, uh, Europe, the US, China, India, uh, I could get affordable, high quality, always on grocery delivery. So that cooking was easy, uh, entertaining was easy, and I could, I could do so anywhere at all. But in Malaysia, in Southeast Asia, this was not the case. Uh, true, there were examples of people who had tried it of varying degrees of success, but there was always the challenge of delivery was extremely expensive. Uh, the range of products available was extremely limited. It so my grocer is unique, at least it was back then, and it still is unique in many ways today in Southeast Asia. We control the entire ecosystem. Uh, our software that you see, and, and you've seen the website, the e-commerce part of it is the smallest part of the business. We're actually a full inventory, warehousing, retail, distribution, and delivery system. Uh, everything we used was custom. We built it specifically for this purpose. So it's extremely fast. It's lightweight, but it's also very, very secure. It's designed with the customer experience in mind. So you can get your weekly shop on MyGrocer done, uh, accessing about 18,000 products right now. And it approximates what you would find in a premium supermarket, but it also approximates what you would find as a business owner. So if you're a restaurant, you could come to us and get food services items. You know, you, you talked about um, addressing both B2B and, sorry, the consumer and the food service sort of B2C, B2B yes. uh, segments as well. Is that how it originally started? I mean, did you have the restaurants and food service in mind already? There are platforms that do that, but not, not as many. I thought that was a very novel idea. So the, the thing is, we always knew we wanted to do it. Uh, what the past 18 months did to us, however, is it accelerated certain parts, it decelerated others. So when we, when we hit the switch two years ago, uh, and, and it really feels weird to be saying that, two years ago, uh, we had a growing number of uh, customers in the Horeca segment. We also had you know, a couple of restaurants, some bakeries, international schools, uh, businesses will come to us for their pantry needs. Factories will come to us because they have staff canteens and they want to staff these things. Uh, and we are one restaurant and, and their need was particular. So they, they're a noodle chain, right? They have seven outlets. And they, and they have these little bowls that they sell to noodle in and they wanted bak choy. But the bak choy needed to be a particular size because if it's too big, it falls out of the bowl. If it's too small, it falls in. And so we could do these sort of things. We could guarantee the sizes. We could guarantee the timing. Um, wow. So... This is, I mean, if I'm, if I'm understanding this correctly, this is distinctly different from, you know, your usual, the big marketplaces where people mm -hmm. buy and you've got different people selling things. I mean, that, this is a very high degree of control of yes. the product, not just the delivery aspect, but before 
you start the delivery, there's a whole lot of control that, that, that's going on as well. I mean, you're saying you've got your own inventory with the cloud stores. Um, talk me through a little bit more about that in terms of, I mean, what are some of the backend processes that you feel are very unique to my grocer that are helping you achieve this very high standard? Okay. So coming into the industry, I, I wasn't from the grocery industry, but I'd spent about uh, at that point, three, three and a half years consulting with the largest chains in Malaysia and some of the largest, and, and they were affiliated with the largest chains in the region. So we had an inside view at hypermarkets, at premium supermarkets, and at mid-range supermarkets. And, and, that, and prior to that, I'd actually consulted with the largest ride-hailing companies. So we had seen how delivery was being done, and we'd helped them to do that, right? And we had also done work with the food delivery companies. So I, I was quite fortunate. My, my previous career had sort of given me insight into these things. And coming from a background in, in software programming, while I escaped early, I did understand the basics of it a little bit. And it became increasingly evident that it was never a question of complexity in terms of getting product to people. It was really simple. Uh, let's take an example of an apple, right? Or uh, strawberry. Uh, we grow strawberries in Malaysia. Uh, they grow about three to four hours outside the city. Now, the question is, once they grow, how do you get them to the customer in just enough time so that it's kept fresh and it's in good shape? Yeah. That's a question of efficiency. And efficiency is where software shines. And that was where we started with. So we decided we needed to have software that could actually get product from point A to point B. Point B being a space where we can store it and process it. So how do you store product? Uh, do you store it in a supermarket? or do you store it in a, in a private area? And the reason we didn't go with the supermarket model was food safety. So of course, this was before the pandemics of the day, but in hindsight, it proved what we said. And that if food is coming into a, into a warehouse and then it's handled, and then it's taken and it's sent to a supermarket and it's handled again, and then it's put on display, and now everybody touches the food. By the time you take it home, for one thing, it's been touched a lot. It's not in the best of shape. In our case, when produce, product, or anything else arrives at our stores, it enters a cold room or a temperature control area. It never leaves that until it's time to be put in a bag. Stephen, I want to talk to you as somebody who's an expert of the, of, of the market. I think you, you, know, you were talking about software and rightly or wrongly, and I'm assuming rightly, I see you as somebody who's sitting on top of a lot of consumer transaction data, you know, uh, or, or at least the knowledge of it. Uh, I want to ask you a little bit about how you think consumer trends and consumer tastes have changed. So yes, you know, there's a lot of conversation about how people are buying more online and there is this shift from Horeca to eating at home, you know, some partially by force, partially out of fear. Uh, but in terms of what people are eating, I mean, what sort of categories do you see have started to do well? Is there a shift in, in habits and food choices? So I, I think that, the, the, and it's interesting, we were, we were talking about this, this shift from Horeca to home and home to Horeca as the markets reopen, right? Um, I think it's going to rebalance itself and, and it's going to go back to sort of a 50-50 split uh, because now people after two years have had a taste of eating at home and they realize the economic impact of not having to spend outside as much. And, and that might be a huge, huge shift in how people think about these things. Uh, but also people have realized that it's not as expensive as they thought to not go out. Uh, you can get high quality food delivered. Uh, what are people doing? I, I've seen a lot of comfort food being taken in the past two years. Uh, ice cream, huge, huge demand for ice cream. We couldn't keep it in stock and it didn't help that global supply chains were, were constrained. So. You had ice cream, yogurt, uh, you had things like soft drinks, uh, you had peanut butter, uh, you know, things like that, uh, actually being in high demand. Nutella, you know, if you want to go with a brand, Nutella was, was constantly in demand and, and that was always fun. We had things like uh, instant, uh, instant oats, instant noodles. So things that people could eat quickly because they were working from home and they wanted to get it done quickly. Uh, snacks, quick eats. But at the same time, you also saw a lot of fresh food that they could cook. Uh, and you saw the, the old time staples. Uh, in Malaysia, Milo was, was, has always been a, a, a top selling product and that remained in force. Uh, we see a lot of consumption of uh, poultry, so chicken, as opposed to other items. 
But at the same time, a lot more leafy greens started going up. And we saw that. Uh, surprisingly, we saw huge amounts of potato chips being consumed as well. So it was always, always interesting to see the, the shopping baskets because as the month went on, uh, and as I imagine people got more, more stressed, you could actually see the, the shopping changes. Uh, we also see people looking at flavor profiles. So in Malaysia, I think we're seeing a lot of questions around how can we see different flavor profiles? So can we see, uh, if you will, the international flavors, but with a local twist? So marmalade with local spices, uh, chocolate with chili, right? Uh, can you see different treatments of that? And I think that is where we're starting in that we're, we're seeing localized flavor profiles of foods that we're already familiar with uh, overseas. We're seeing some of that coming in. Uh, people travel, they come back, they sort of fusionize the food and they bring it up. Then uh, being stuck at home for two years has created a lot of home cooks who have discovered their passion for what they're doing and they're, they're creating these, these businesses. So you're getting uh, what can be termed, I suppose, as low preservative products coming out of uh, small operations. So they start in their kitchens and they go into these uh, central kitchens that they use. And you're getting a lot of sauces, a lot of sambals, a lot of, of condiments that you can put onto food, right? But we also see uh, a lot of, and, and I find this particularly interesting, are you seeing a lot of products coming out where people who've cooked for many years. So I was looking at one this morning and it's a restaurant out in Malacca and, and they do this asam pedas dish. But the guy who did it decided that, you know, I can commercialize the recipe. So he started packaging the uh, core material, which will allow you to cook the sambal at home or an approximation of it. And so it comes in a foil bag and it has instructions on it. You tear it out and you use it. And I, and I think that's brilliant because the propagation of the flavor is coming out there. And, and that's another thing we have seen. So it's a mixture of people who are very aware and very concerned about these things. Uh, then you have people who just want the lowest price items. And I think that really is something that, that is very true in Malaysia right now. One of the projects that we did, uh, it was a survey with sort of food, food companies. So they had a little bit of distributors, a little bit of restaurants. Um, their feeling, and this was their speculation, that local suppliers will start trumping international suppliers, you know, and it could be the China effect or, or, or what have you. Uh, are you seeing that on my grocer as well? Are you seeing a preference for local brands or is it more the taste angle that you talked about? So the thing is, uh, we have a customer profile that's quite wide, uh, both in terms of age and economics, as well as spending power. Do local flavors shop international? I wouldn't say yes entirely. I think it goes by product category. It goes back to brand preference, brand familiarity. It goes back to taste flavor profiles and people are willing to experiment within that. So if you're looking for uh, pickled vegetables, typically you would have grown up with a brand and you're going to look at that. But if you see another brand come out and the price is right, you might try it. And that's where that happens. Right? And, and you're not really looking at, is it important, is it not? The important question becomes more important in the finished goods, uh, like drinks and uh, comfort foods and things. So our ice cream, for instance, we have the, the local brands that we sell, but at the same time, we have quite a few international brands and both do equally well. When you were looking at people that are making both indulgent choices and healthy choices. I mean, do you see the suppliers coming in with a different message to say, well, hey, this is, I don't know, high calcium. Or is, is that that kind of message, high calcium, high protein, uh, we've seen the high something or enriched with something as a value proposition start to come up in a more, it, sort of that message has become louder than low sugar, low fat, low in the bad stuff. You know, I mean, are you seeing things like that happen on my grocer as well? So yes. the, you know, the shift in, I've got to eat more of something rather than mm. less of the bad stuff. Uh, brands are bringing more and more information and conversation to us where they're saying, this is enriched with that, and this has more of this, and this has less of that. Uh, but a lot of the conversation is being driven by them directly, I think, through their own social assets, through their advertising, uh, through their on-ground on activation, now their markets are reopening. Uh, consumers in Malaysia are interested but I'm not entirely sure how much of the buying decision is being driven by that on the mass. I can say on, on the affluent side, definitely. 
they are they are more aware, they're very concerned. Uh, but for the greater consumer, I think they're looking just as importantly at price. That's fair. That's fair. Um, Stefan, I've got a whole bunch of other questions, but I'm conscious of the time. So, you know, I want to thank you for really very interesting ideas, very, very novel ideas. And, you know, I'm, I'm really excited to see the future developments that you're describing. My I, I thought customization of diet was something that I definitely want to do. Um, I hope that you can bring it to Singapore and around the region at some point, and then we'll, we, we'll have- we, we hope so, we hope so. So, you know, we, we're actually uh, in the middle of an active fundraise right now. So, want us to come to Singapore, tell your friends to come along and invest in us. <laughs>